Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we are talking about companion planting. And this question was actually a special request from a patron on Patreon. If I said that right, I probably messed that up somehow. Anyways, and it's a great question. I haven't actually done a video on this. So we're going to be going into the science of companion planting, not so much the Pinterest posts and that sort of thing. And I'm not going to give you a list of what you should put together. I'm just going to give you my opinion on companion planting and what the scientific journals tell us about companion planting specifically. If you guys just want that printout and you just want the information, you don't want to have to sit through the video, be sure to check out the blog. I have a printable sheet there that you can download and use in the future. So companion planting, I feel like, has gained a lot of momentum in the world of Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, that sort of thing. And I believe it's completely spurred of the fact that more people are getting into gardening that are located in cities. And because when you are in a city, you have a limited space or limited land to work with, and therefore you're trying to pack in as many plants close together as you possibly can fit. And ultimately what ends up happening in some cases is you will notice lower rates of germination, potentially plants that aren't doing very well together and that sort of thing. And that's where these companion planting guides have come from. Now, I think that they've been, they've taken a simple concept and they've made it very complicated and there's so many rules behind companion planting. So I'm going to give you three, literally three things you need to follow when taking companion planting into consideration and how to avoid either low rates of germination or stunted growth in the plants that you are planting. So like I said, companion planting diagrams were completely spurred out of the fact that people are growing in smaller spaces. Due to these smaller spaces, we are having lower rates of germination, lower stunted growth. Because companion planting is such a hot topic, I feel as though people have overcomplicated this for the average gardener and that is not what I want. I want to make gardening very, very simple and I personally look at those companion planting diagrams and immediately get overwhelmed with them. So I believe, so we're gonna be going into three factors you should take into consideration, what the science says behind companion planting and all that fun stuff. The first question we have to ask is, does companion planting really matter that much? And my answer to this is kinda sorta. The reason I say kind of sorta is because I personally do not follow any companion planting guidelines. Like I said, I find them way over complicated and I plant stuff where I wanna plant stuff. It's as simple as that. However, if you are dealing in a small space, there is some rules you need to follow. Because I have enough space to grow what I want to grow, I don't have to worry about companion planting. I can spread things out enough where I just don't end up with any of those issues. But if you're working in a smaller garden or you really want to cram stuff in, such as like a square foot garden, for example, then you may want to take into consideration companion planting and how to go about it. So the number one thing to keep in mind when it comes to companion planting is plants from different environments or plants with similar needs being in the same area. So when I talk about different environments, I mean you can't plant a pond plant with a succulent, obviously. So you have to keep in mind watering needs, sunlight needs, nutrient needs when planting plants together. And you want to keep everything in the same family or the same realm. And one of the easiest ways to look at this is on the drastic ends of things. So you can put a sedum, for example, with a salvia plant. Now, while sedum likes very dry, very hot, and salvia likes, you know, full sun, but plenty of water, they can do okay with each other. It's just you don't wanna be on the extremes of either end. Similarly, you don't want to be too close together, especially when it comes to nutrient needs, for example. So you don't want to plant two very heavy feeders next to each other or close into a vicinity. 
The exception to this rule when it comes to heavy feeders is if you are willing to fertilize for a heavy feeder. So for example, on my website, I have a list of what would be considered a heavy feeder in the vegetable world. Tomatoes, corn, cabbage, that sort of thing. So say you planted a row of corn and then you planted a row of tomatoes right next to each other. You can do this, no problem. However, if you choose to do this, you want to fertilize appropriately. So you may want to double your fertilizing regimen or you may want to leave a buffer or plant the corn in a different plot than the tomatoes. Or you can do corn, you know, beans, peas, legumes, and then tomatoes. If, do you catch what I mean? So heavy feeders together without supplementing is less than ideal. Same thing goes with plants that require a ton of water. So if we're talking squashes, melons, and that sort of thing, really almost anything that has a full fruit on it, you don't want to put a ton of those in the same area or next to each other, especially if you are not willing to water every day or in some cases, depending on the size of land you're dealing with or the climate you're working in, twice a day. So if you don't wanna water a ton, you're gonna to wanna to spread those out. Now, a common misconception when it comes to companion planting that I just want to debunk right here, right now, is that if you put a cantaloupe next to a zucchini, that it's going to mean a cantaloupe zucchini type offspring. And that's just simply not the case. It does, that's not possible, you guys. So when a zucchini pollen fertilizes a cantaloupe flower, or whatever the case is, it's not going to make this hybrid of the two. It's just simply impossible. And companion planting, even if it was possible, isn't going to cause, you're not gonna be protected from it because pollinators, I'm sorry to break it to you, don't stay in lanes. They don't just check out one bed and then totally ignore another. You are getting pollen from all over your neighborhood. So I can guarantee you, your cantaloupe, your watermelon, your zucchini, your cucumber are getting mixed. It's just a fact. And I can go into more about the actual breeding of plants and how the zucchini melons or the cucumber zucchini franken fruit things you see online, how there's something else going on there and has nothing to do with improper companion planting. So this leads me to my second. The last one is my absolute favorite, but the second one is spacing. So something that you should ultimately take into consideration is the height of your plants. So because fruits and vegetables need a ton of light to survive, you want to take into consideration the height of the plant and whether or not it's going to shade out or harm the amount of light that another plant is going to receive. So for example, if we have an indeterminate tomato plant and we plant it right next to some uh, bush beans, for example, the height difference is going to shade out those bush beans. So you will have lower yields on that plant. Now there are ways around this, of course, if you are in an area that is high, high amounts of sun and you are regularly pruning your tomato plants and keeping that canopy nice and clean, which allows the sun to penetrate to the soil surface, then your bush beans will be just fine. Another method to actually prevent this and companion plants to normally incompatible plants would be to put your shorter plants, so things like carrots, beets, uh, bush beans, anything that is on the ground in front of or on the south or west side of your plot and the taller plants towards the north or the eastern side of the plot. That means that the sun will obviously hit the shorter plants first and then the taller plants at the end and the shorter ones won't be shaded out. So it's another thing that you see on a lot of these companion planting chart guides is they're looking at the height of the plant and trying to make sure that you're not putting carrots beside tomatoes because they don't want you to shade it out. However, you can still do this. You just have to position the carrots in the right place in juxtaposition of those taller plants, such as 
your tomatoes or peppers. So my third one is my absolute favorite and it is allopathic plants. And now this phenomenon is studied in plant science and soil science, that sort of thing, but it isn't very well determined. Like we don't know with absolute certainty that something's going on here. So they haven't been able to 100% prove that it is an issue, but they can say that there's enough irregularities to know that something is going on. So allopathic or allopathic tendencies or allopathic plants, properties, that anything allopathic is referring to the release of toxins from a plant that actually cause plants around it not to germinate or to have stunted growth. Now, this is a real phenomenon. Like I said, there's way too many coincidences to completely write it off in the scientific community. However, companion planting guides and influencers take it just a little bit too far in saying that these allopathic properties are emitted from the plants all the time, nonstop, in the midst of the growing season, yada, yada, yada. And that's simply not the case. So I'm going to debunk this right now that you will not have allopathic properties in a tomato plant that is in the middle of focusing on growing. You will have allopathic properties in a tomato plant that has began to decompose. And it's because when studies have looked at allopathic properties in plants, they have determined that it is actually located in the upper biomass of the plant. That means because it's actually in the tissue, in order for it to be released into the ecosystem or to have any effect on the surrounding plants, it needs to be decomposing. And there's a reason for this. The purpose of allopathic properties in a plant is purely to ensure that other seeds around that plant do not germinate other than the ones that they want to germinate. So a tomato plant that's not cultivated and is not domesticated in the wild would have grown. It would have dropped its fruit on the ground. The plant, the upper biomass, would fall to the ground, decompose, and eventually the seeds in that fruit would germinate. The purpose of that dead tissue releasing the toxins is to prevent other plants from germinating. This is going to do two big things. It's going to reduce the amount of competition the plant is exposed to for things such as light, water, nutrients. And secondly, it's also going to dampen its own species. So it's actually going to reduce the rate of germination in the tomato plant itself. If you had an entire tomato germinating on the ground, that plant would be competing with itself and it actually would cause even more issues because it could result in higher numbers of pests and disease. So to prevent this, the plant is going to emit a very small toxin, enough to discourage competing plants, but also to discourage the plants of its own species. These allopathic properties have been made out in the world of gardening to be very specific and they know to just attack carrots or they know just to attack beets. And that's not the case. They attack everything, even their own kind. So if allopathic properties were at all a thing and if we were at all worried about them when it came to companion planting, we would actually be worried about any plant near it, including its own type. So these aren't selective, these aren't uh, smart, they don't have the ability to block out just certain plants and not others, they are just baseline toxic. And it's purely self-preservation that gears this up. Now, because it is mostly in dead plant tissue, if you are cleaning up, say, your tomato patch at the end of the season and you're composting your upper biomass, you won't have this issue. You won't have that toxin being released into the soil. It is such a 
a low base level toxin that if you compost it, things, just natural weathering that happens in compost, such as rain and microbes, are going to degrade that relatively quickly so you actually won't have any issue. The, the big issue with this allopathic property in a plant is actually seen more so in mulch. And so you should be watching what kinds of mulch you get or what types of compost that aren't fully degraded that you choose to put into your garden. Because depending on the mulch that you choose, if it has some sort of um, allopathic tendency to it, it will ultimately snuff out any germination of plants and it could ultimately stunt some growth of your plants itself. So a really good example of this is I'm starting to see more and more gardeners utilizing straw bales, which is awesome. That's really good. However, there are um, hay bales that I have seen people use as well. And hay, especially if it's like el has alfalfa in it, for example, has a very high level of that allopathic tendency. Alfalfa is actually so toxic. It snuffs out itself and it can eventually snuff out its entire field. So you want to make sure you're removing your plant debris at the end of every year. I know this is hugely counterintuitive to the new movement and regenerative egg and that sort of thing. And I'm sorry, but that's just what the science tells us is that certain plants fall into this category and we should be taking precautions to ensure that those toxins aren't leached into the ground, especially if we want higher rates of germination. So that would be the number one other reason why you see these companion planting charts. However, I listed out all the known vegetable crops that have a higher level or a notable level of this toxic type chemical. And therefore those plants, if you choose to put them in your garden, are the ones that you should remove the debris from and compost, or they are also the plants that you should consider putting a buffer around. So if you are worried, now again, I haven't, I personally in my garden have not experienced this. And let me tell you, I put a lot of plants in one planter, especially tomato plants. I really jam them in. Now, if you're worried about it, you need to give the plant proper spacing. You're going to want to prune on a regular basis, that sort of thing. So just follow your planting guide in regards to your spacing for a tomato plant, for example, and voila, your problem is solved. So like I promised, three steps or three things to keep in mind when you're gardening or when you're planning your garden. For example, I have the uh, Gardening in Canada uh, planner that you guys can use where you can actually plot out where everything is going. You can get it for free on Connected to the Land or you can purchase it off my Etsy shop. It's completely up to you what you want to use. And basically when you're planning or when you're utilizing that guide, you can take these three things into consideration. The first one being environment. If you're going to put two heavy feeders together, you're going to want to make sure you fertilize for it. If you're going to put plants that literally are from different environments in the same area, you better be prepared to have the soil positioned or made into the properties that that plant needs. And secondly, you're going to want to make sure for height that you are getting your short plants enough sun to survive and you're not shading them out with your bigger plants. So figure out your location and where your sun's setting, where your sun's rising, that sort of thing. And Thirdly, you're going to want to watch those plants that have some toxins in them. You're going to want to make sure that you're cleaning up the plant debris, but you're also going to want to make sure you give proper spacing around those plants so that they don't snuff out themselves, but also surrounding plants in the area. I hope you guys found this video helpful. I hope this gave you a little bit of a different twist when it comes to companion planting. If you enjoyed it, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button if you made it to the end of this video because it clearly means you enjoy this. And I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.